with who Janine is. Welcome, Janine. Tell us about yourself. How did you get into dreaming? Well, um, I work as a registered nurse in the intensive care unit, and I typically care for patients with neurological or trauma-related injuries in comatose states. Um, I, they're usually in these comatose states either from their brain injuries or they're medically induced. And because of the patient population I work with, I became very interested in altered states of consciousness and specifically dreaming because it's a natural altered state of consciousness that we experience every single night. And um, I regularly record and I study my own dreams. And now I have a great opportunity to talk about and study dreams scientifically with Dr. Michelle Carr and Dr. Mm -hmm. McNamara. So thanks for welcoming me to the YouTube channel. I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, we're excited to have you here. Yeah. I don't know if I um, if I told you this story. So Janine, you reached out to both myself and Patrick, just wanting to get inter into dream research and curious about the field and wanting to see if there are any opportunities. And I don't know if I told you, but I actually, you emailed me yourself and then Patrick forwarded me an email from you saying oh, really? that this person seems really into dream research and exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and then Tori Nielsen also forwarded your email. <laughs> I emailed like every I was fine from going up. And, like, and uh, into this. <laughs> yeah, there was even uh, Dr. Patty Moss as well from uh, MIT who does dream engineering work. She forwarded yeah. your email as well. And I was like, okay, I have to talk to Janine. <laughs> everyone, everyone heard from you, which is great. I mean, and that's what I did too when I first wanted to do dream research. I just emailed every dream researcher I could find and and they're a welcoming and bunch. Or, so. or I answered? I had emailed, like, I, had, I was going through the membership list of the International Association yeah. for the Study of Dreams and just asking people, like, where can I learn about dream science? Where can I do research? Fantastic. And um, a lot of people pointed me to Tori's lab. So I reached out to him and he responded, took me on as a graduate student. <laughs> yeah. That's really funny. I'm, I'm happy that you did basically the same thing because I was like, I need some, like I have like such a, like a different background. I know it's like scientific, but I want to get into dreaming and I kind of wanted a little guidance on how to do that. So it was nice to reach out to everybody and thankfully I heard back and now I'm here. <laughs> so. You want to pursue a PhD in it, do you think? Or? I would like to do something. I just don't know exactly how to get there, or what I would need to do. Like a lot of people have said to me that I need to do like a psych degree or first, like I have to have like a bachelor's in psych or neuroscience. So I'm like, well, I have nursing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. know if you would need that. But... Yeah, I agree. I don't think you would need that. Yeah. You have a, a lot of experience. So it's yeah. relevant experience, medical experience. So. But like, yeah. do you think that it would be master's program into like neuroscience or something? Like, I, I just don't know how to get into it. You really. could you could do it in psychology or neuroscience. Yeah. Either one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And then do what Michelle did. Just hook up with a person who specializes in sleep and dreams for your graduate work for your dissertation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you you've already got. Is it a master's in nursing or a bachelor's? No, it's a bachelor's degree. So, so yeah, you don't, you don't, so you could go right from that to the PhD. So really that's one route. <laughs> and then uh, me and Michelle will help you get published and stuff. You know? That would be nice. That would be <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of working with comatose patients, yeah. yeah. I've been, I, I was drawn to the literature on near-death experiences several times yeah. in my life and never took it that seriously, never delved into it. And till I, I um, read some stuff by a guy named Mark Whitman, who's a mainstream neuroscientist that I respect. He specializes in um, time consciousness, mm. the, the neuroscience of time basically. Oh, that's really interesting. And he looked into the near-death experience literature and was convinced there's something there. Um, and 
he for the longest time thought that it could be reduced to a disinhibition of the REM state, basically. You know, the phenomenology mm -hmm. associated with near-death experiences, you know, the tunnel, the seeing the light, and um, mm -hmm. life review of memories, and stuff, all that kind of stuff. And then he really, he delved into the literature, and, and he says in his most recent book, which is, I think, published by MIT Press, that there are certain cases of NDEs that can't be explained with current science. And that suggests that you can have some form of consciousness um, without at the same time having typical brain activity. You will need to have had brain activity sometime in your history, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, but he's got no categories to understand NDEs. And, um, but mm -hmm. the category that he thinks most applies to it is dreaming. Yeah. I mean, I do, do you see patients like that? Have you um, interviewed any who have had those kinds of experiences? Not particularly, but I was really interested in um, like anesthesia for a yeah, while. Yeah. And I was interested in how the concept of time and those vegetative state patients are basically in the same realm, like yeah. very different compared to sleeping brains. So like yeah. when you're sleeping, you know that there's time passed, but like when you're under mm -hmm. anesthesia, you have no idea yeah. what time it is. You just wake up and you're like, what the heck? Like, it felt like I just yeah. like shut my eyes and that was it and I woke up and it was, everything was, you know, three hours passed by with the surgery and they wake up and it's like yeah. oh, I didn't even know all that time passed, but yeah. in sleeping you know that time has passed. So you mm -hmm. can get that kind of experience with fugue states sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, but they're extremely rare, I think. Yeah, the concept of time and dream is also really interesting as well. Like you can have a whole story in a matter of like what one two minutes. <laughs> Um, yeah, is that right, Michelle. Do you, I can't. I don't know the science behind that. Do you? Um, is, I think is, you know. There, there's lucid dreams that we can time. People yeah. who have lucid dreams, we can actually measure. The amount I mean, of time. yeah. I think so. There, there was one study that suggested with lucid dreaming that your time perception is similar in in a lucid dream as when it when you're awake. Like you can count through time and it, and it seems to be the same amount of time. But, but then there are other instances, of course, where like, I don't know if there's research on this, but where, you know, you set your alarm to snooze and you go back to sleep for like three minutes and a whole, yeah. whole dream like story, a, dream a whole narrative story. has happened, right? So, yeah, yeah. so it seems like both are possible. And then the opposite can happen too, where like you go into deep sleep where your, your sleep schedule is off and you wake up really confused and you have no idea what time it is or how much time has passed. So it mm. doesn't seem to be just one type of time perception that happens when you're sleeping. Yeah. 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 So that's a wide open area for research then, you know, the time sense in dreams and it doesn't tell us anything about how the brain keeps time or about the nature of time itself. Yeah, it just seems like time is super malleable in the dream mm -hmm. state, so. Or certainly, at the very least, there are different types of time, yeah. different types of duration. There's right. clock time, experiential time, subjective time, narrative time. Yeah, that's true, because you can have narrative time where, you know, people can have dreams that seem to last like months, but yeah, I, experientially, yeah. it might not feel like months, but it's like you go through different scenes and different montages. It's kind of like yeah. maybe like watching a movie where it spans a long period of narrative time, but it's hard to say how that feels just as like a, a body, like experientially, how much time it feels has passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you noticed any, Janine, any um, patterns in your, you said you've been recording your dreams? Yeah. Um... I definitely, um, well, it's funny, I guess, because like I have a lot of um, patient related dreams, um, <laughs> especially like after I work, I have like, um, I guess probably the day residue that comes into my dream, but 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny because I was actually just talking to my dad about this about how um, you don't have time to process feelings when you're at work. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and you kind of just like go through the day and you have to keep a straight face when you're, you know, going through the motions of work and um, you can't process those feelings of patience like deteriorating in front of you and yeah. I think at night when you dream um sometimes I do have dreams where patients visit me or I see them in my dream and um it affects me the next day if, if I feel more connected to them and that connection mm-hmm. that I can't experience during my shift work so it's mm-hmm. it changes me definitely um I feel a lot more um I guess, humane, human with those mm. people. I, I try to find that type of relationship. So I thankfully have these dreams that I record all, all the time now. And I feel um, a sense of like uh, empathy or sympathy. I relate to these patients more. So, mm. yeah. That's, a, that's amazing. That's a, 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 might be a brand new way to um, maintain that balance. I mean, to be like a neutral and on the job while you're caring for somebody in these life threatening situations. But then using your dreams to retain the human element. Right. You, know, you, you have to be like a machine almost at work. Yeah. yeah. If, if you care about them, you've got to be on task. Yeah. You can't be crying or whatever. No, you can't. You so have you got to, to reserve some other part of you and you're using dreams for that that's amazing yeah Yeah. so i'm very thankful that i started doing this and Mm -hmm. um you know it was a completely random thing that i got into it so i'm very happy that i found it yeah there is some research on or new a recent theory of, of dreaming one of the evolutionary functions of dreaming about social simulation that um when you when we, I mean, social coordination is like kind of a huge evolutionary pressure on, on being human and surviving as, as a species and that dreaming might help us to, re, I mean, dreams are so social and they're so frequently incorporate characters from our life and, and they might help us to maintain and to build relationships with, with the people around us. Um, so that's kind of a recent evolutionary theory of, of dream simulations, social simulation theory. Yeah, I, I spoke quite a bit about that theory and that perspective in my most recent book on dreams. Hmm. And I think that that one has a lot of um, data supporting it. I mean, uh, many dream theories have good data support, but that one has a really consistent set of data supporting it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and if you think about it, not just in terms of, well, uh, we use our dreams to rehearse things so that we're better at social skills, but also the, uh, as you point out, Michelle, the evolutionary background of it, that you have to have these strategic mind reading skills mm. in order to be in these coalitions, these political coalitions. Um, and- well, I could, yeah. Um, potentially even further with dreaming, like you're not just it's, it's different than waking life because you're not just um, like interacting with other characters, you're actually creating them. So you really do know what they're feeling and you really can read their minds to some extent because they're, you're, you're creating them as you're interacting them with them, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. I guess like another part that's pretty interesting to me about dreams too is like kind of hitting on that is like you can recognize identities in people even though they don't look like the person Mm -hmm. like that is honestly bizarre to me yeah yeah know that like it is that person contradictory to like what they look like yeah I've had that a lot in my dreams as well Mm -hmm. Freud talked a lot about that but I haven't seen that studied in mainstream science these days have you Michelle Um, There was one paper a couple years ago by a Polish group that talked about this, that you can, you often just have a feeling of knowing what's, 
and it's not just people it can be it can be places like I knew I was in my house it didn't look anything like my house but I knew it was my house or I knew I was at work or I knew I was talking to my mother even though she turned into a cat like <laughs> it's like yeah. somehow because because the image isn't just you know a visual representation right it's created from more I mean they talked about um, kind of embodied cognition and the, the idea that these representations are not just visual, they're created from all sorts of memory sources that you have about this house or this person. So you, you have kind of a felt sense about where you are in the dream and who you're talking to. And it's not just based on what, what things look like visually or even what things sound like. It's kind of a more holistic um, creation. Yeah. yeah. If I see in front of me in my dream, an old man with a cane and you know, white hair and stuff. But I know that that is my 13 year old daughter. You know, how does that work? Like Janine says, you know, like, it is, you know, is it just because our dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is shut down and we don't have self-critical capacity? It, it's just, that, that doesn't seem to me to capture how unusual i mean like how strange and bizarre that is that we yeah. know who that is and yet we remember later on that that person looked like somebody completely different right but there must be some association there like there's some underneath just the visual representation there's some reason for this metaphor right it's not just a completely random uh, metaphor it's like like, like Ernest Hartman always talking about, there's some emotional core that's leading to the generation of this mm -hmm. metaphor. So, I don't know, have you had dreams where your daughter was an old man with a cane? <laughs> no, but I've often felt like, uh, you know, listening to her talk that, wow, she's got the wisdom of an old man, you know? Yeah, <laughs> you know, there you so, go. Well, maybe, <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe that's the, the metaphor sticking in there, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. But how do we know when something's a metaphor in a dream? You know, is every image in a dream a metaphor? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. I don't Jean know. Knows. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. I'm trying to yeah. I'm trying to think of examples where it's clearly not a metaphor. I guess that would be a good thing to ask. Well, so what, what in dreams is exact, is realistic? If you can't disprove it, then is it a good theory? It can't be falsified. It's not a good theory. Still a good question. <laughs> the theory that every image in a dream is a metaphor, you can't falsify it. No. Yeah. But I guess you could look at what types of things in dreams are most... Um, just re replications of waking life versus where do you th see things that are more symbolic and metaphorical? Mm -hmm. Like I use my cell phone sometimes in dreams, <laughs> which is always frustrating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Never works very well. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that was another uh, Hartman study about that people don't read or write or do math in, in yeah, dreams, that was remember? Very observation but i i definitely now yeah i struggle with writing emails and answering cell phones and te doing text messages i have dreams like that however can i tell a quick dream i know yes uh, because you just remind me of this but yeah this was just last week um i was walking with a group of people and somebody was putting these very ornate robes on me and i could feel them weighing me down and I had some special connection with one of the women in, in the group. And later, a lot, a lot of stuff happened. Later on, the woman and I sat down and I had to leave. And so she wanted to exchange phone numbers. So we didn't have paper or anything. So I wrote down my phone number on her hand with my finger. And I distinctly remember writing with my finger. Then she did the same on my hand. <laughs> So there was an instance of writing, in a, you know, in a dream, but that's very rare. And it worked. Yeah. Yeah. I Did still you see have the numbers? Oh. You have her number? <laughs> <laughs> Did you call her? <laughs> I'm too scared to call her. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> oh. 
No, I didn't remember her number. I did in the dream, but when I woke up, it was gone. Um, an artist reached out to me recently who, a lucid artist, lucid dream yes. artist. Did I show you that? And he- um, No, he reached out to me too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where he does drawings in lucid dreams and then- Yeah, it looked interesting. He'll yeah. kind of like, he'll memorize what the drawing looks like and then he'll wake up and he'll do the drawing for, re for real, in real yeah, life. That's... Perhaps we should interview him at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that was interesting. Yeah. You ever had lucid dreams, Janine? No, but I have come close. I feel like lucid dreaming is honestly the gateway to a lot of different things, though. A lot of mm. um, uh, potentials, or we can, um, what is that? I guess, like, try experiments with it that could, like, help with psychology reasons, mm -hmm. I think, and well-being. Um, that's like what I'm particularly interested in, like trying to help with psychology or mm -hmm. in that sort of direction. You Did mean you to use dreams as therapy, some kind of therapeutic intervention? Yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot of promise there. Mm -hmm. But it's just hard to try to induce it. That's the thing. I mean, I know some people are more natural at it, but... Mm. I've come close a few times and it's so frustrating. <laughs> what, what happens when you come close? Like I always say, oh, that's weird. And <laughs> like, the one time I actually did do a reality check, I actually did do it, but then I got distracted. Like yeah. somebody had like ran past me and I like got distracted yeah. and didn't finish out the reality check. Or another time I just said, oh, that's weird. And then like, I would even think like, okay, well, what was I just doing before? And then like, I was like, I, I can't remember. Okay, whatever. And then like, I'm going like, <laughs> you know? So, like, yeah, same yeah. thing happens to me when, when I try to incubate a lucid dream. I'm not successful. Yeah. And it, it happens to me all the time. I feel like I get that all the time, mm -hmm. but it's like not there. I just... Don't know how to get over that bridge yeah i definitely have both both of the like that happens to me all the time too like i'll have i'll even do reality checks like i'll turn the lights on and off and they don't work and i'm like uh oh, that's really weird <laughs> <laughs> or i'm like flying through the sky and i'm like usually i can only fly when i'm dreaming and now i've finally learned how to fly <laughs> in real life you know <laughs> so yeah we're really good at confabulating yeah, telling ourselves that this is just, this is real. This is, yeah. Mm. Well, that, that, that issue of, you know, not knowing what's real in a dream, I mean, that's been one of the fundamental philosophical questions about dreaming for ages and ages and ages. Mm -hmm. And that raises something I'd love to talk about on one of our episodes, and that's a dream within a dream. You know, um, you know, like when yeah. you wake up, you think you're awake, but then you really wake up, you know, yeah. five minutes later or whatever. So also you're walking awakening. around like you're awake, but you're, you're dreaming, you know, and it's utterly convincing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's just interesting. And, every, and, and as we all know, you know, philosophers have been talking about you know, what's the implications of that for our understanding of reality. Well, I was talking with uh, another dream research colleague the other day, uh, Lisa Solomonova, and we were talking about, about this idea because, you know, kind of the, what, what people usually say is, you know, your, your prefrontal cortex is kind of less activated, so we don't question what's going on, and so we don't realize how bizarre dreams are. We don't realize how, yeah, yeah I mean, dreams are thought of as being really bizarre compared to waking life. But then we were talking about, well, but dreaming isn't bizarre compared to dreaming. And we've been experiencing dreams since before we were even born, possibly, right? Like we've had more, our dreaming self has been alive and has been experiencing this world, you know, since we were, well, at least since we were born. And it's like, it's just, it's, it's normal when you're in a dream. This is what the dreaming world is like. So maybe it's not that weird that we don't question it. We don't question our reality because if we did, that would be 
that wouldn't work. It wouldn't work if we were constantly questioning what was going on in a dream, and constantly realizing, would it, would it work? I don't know. I get your point, but wouldn't it also be, you know, detrimental if uh, we, you know, if we tried to fly when we really can't fly? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, obviously, there's a role for reality checking and so on and so forth. You know? I get your point yeah. though that um, one one reason it's not just lack of self-critical capacity, it's that we've been dreaming all our lives, and so we take violation of the laws of physics in stride as almost normal. Mm -hmm. And yet I, 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 I still think there's a deep philosophical question there about what does this tell us about reality? It, it, or at least epistemology, right? Like how do we know what's real? I mean, Descartes made this bedrock of his philosophy. You know? How do you know when something's real? How do we know? <laughs> well, we know what Descartes said, and we know what a lot of philosophers said, but nobody buys that anymore. And you know, the simulation hypothesis about reality doesn't have a lot of um, support from physicists, but at least it would it would begin to answer questions like that pretty well. You know, but that's a whole other conversation. Another can of worms. Yeah. <laughs>